Good evening, everybody. I'm uh, delighted to welcome you to this Rosalind Franklin Lecture. So the Rosalind Franklin Award Lecture is supported by the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills, and it's named in honour of a very famous biophysicist, Rosalind Franklin. She made critical contributions to the understanding of the molecular structure of DNA. And the first award was made in 2003. I got the second award, but I can only say that it gets better every year. I think I'm allowed to say that. Um, so I'm Carol Robinson, and I'm delighted to be here tonight to introduce this year's medalist, which is Joe Dunkley. So Joe is an outstanding scientist. We're very sorry that she's moved part of her research to the US but she's a frequent visitor back at Oxford. The medal that she will receive is of silver gilt, so I'm told, and is accompanied by a grant. And this will help her to engage with young women scientists and to really encourage them to participate in science. And I think she is, without doubt, an outstanding role model for young women scientists. I've seen her do public presentations in the past, and she has this amazing way of engaging with young people. So I think tonight's lecture is going to be a real treat. So without further ado, I'm going to invite Jo to give her lecture, which will last for about 40 minutes. I will then invite questions and then present Jo with her award at the end of the lecture. So can you join me in welcoming Jo Dunkley to give her lecture entitled A Window on the Universe. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. Um, so it's a huge honor for me to be able to, to present this lecture and to win this award. Um, it means a great deal to me to get the award, and it's also so exciting for me to be able to share what I love doing the research I love doing with you all. Um, so I think I have one of the best jobs in the world. I'm a scientist, and that means that I get to, I get to ask questions. My job is to ask questions, and then my job is to figure out how I can find answers to those questions. And that means that I'm constantly learning new things, I'm discovering things that we didn't know a decade ago, we didn't know a year ago, we didn't know last week. Um, it's always new. Um, and that just makes it such a thrill. So the kind of question I'll come back, this is one of my windows on the universe that I, that I use in a telescope I use in northern Chile. And I'll come back to it later, in the, later in the lecture. So the kind of questions that I ask are about our place in space, our place in the universe, how we got to be here, how we fit in. And so the kind of questions I care about are how did we get to be here, here on Earth, in our place in the, in the, wider, the wider universe. Um, did the universe we live in have some beginning to it? And when I talk about the universe, I mean everything that we can see in space and everything that we think is then connected to that part that we can see in space that may go beyond what we can ever hope to see. Um, I'd like to know if space stretches on infinitely far. If I set off on a rocket ship, could I just keep going forever? Or would I one day come back and find myself back where I started? I'd like to know if there's life on other planets. Are we alone? Or are there other people, other creatures, other beings out there? Our universe seems to be growing, and I want to know why. And I want to know how it started. And I want to know what the fundamental laws of nature are that govern our universe. What are the building blocks? And what are the, what are the simple laws of physics that tell me how everything should behave? And asking those questions make me an astronomer, an astrophysicist, someone who tries to understand uh, how space works, how things out in space work, and how fundamental physics works too. Now, other scientists have, have many other questions, um, but I chose, th these are the ones that can describe what kind of scientist I am. Now, as well as these questions, I also have one other question too that, that kind of is always at the back of my mind, which is how are we gonna change this, which is this feature of our kind of national science profile at the moment which is that only 20% of the students who study physics at A-level in this country are girls. Um, and almost half the schools in England five years ago didn't have any girls doing physics A-level. Um, 
And to me, that's something that, that, that we should change. <laughs> And you could say, well, that's just because girls and boys are different. They have maybe want to do different things. And yes, we're different. But there are some really hard facts that say that actually we've got something wrong. Because the evidence shows that girls are actually almost twice as likely to go and study physics at A-level if they went to a girls' school than a co-educational mixed school. And that just says that there's something to be fixed, that there's cultural expectations, preconceptions that are sending people in different directions. And so I want to see this change. I want to see this number go up. And I want to see that for two reasons. One is because I would love to see more girls, more women, get to ask the exciting questions that I get to ask. You can't hope to answer any of those questions that I want to answer if you don't keep studying physics, keep studying sciences. Um, and so I think that was just something that people are missing out on. Uh, but on the second side, if we want to answer any great science questions, not only ones that govern space, but govern you know, broader science, we need the best people working on it. And the best people cover a diversity of people. They're all sorts. Now, we have, and I see that in my own, in my own field, um, we have plenty of women in our field. I'm just going to show you some of the great people I already work with. It's just a selection of people. Some of them are here, of my colleagues. Um, in astrophysics. There's plenty of women in astrophysics. There are senior colleagues, uh, grad students, postdocs, undergraduates. And I have plenty of great male colleagues too. Um, but I'd just like to see more girls and women getting into this field and getting to share the excitement of it. OK, so I want to talk about some of the things that we're trying to figure out about, about the universe. So I'm going to start by taking on a little tour of space. So. Where do we live and where are we part of? So here we are on Earth. We're orbiting around the sun with our little moon orbiting around us, pulled by the force of gravity towards our sun and pulled around it, along with the other planets around us. And the solar system is already pretty big. It takes, we often measure distances in astronomy using how long it takes light to travel a certain distance. Um, because light travels at the same speed through space always, and it's the fastest thing we know. It goes at 700 million miles an hour, zooming through space. And the time it takes to get from the sun to us is about eight minutes. So that sets the scale of how big our solar system is in terms of how far we are from the sun. And if we were to go out to the further reaches of the solar system, out to uh, the distant planets Neptune uh, and, and, or beyond, it would take light hours to cross the solar system from the sun to out to those planets. So it's a pretty big place, just our local part of, of the universe. But that's just our local bit. If we take a step out, our little solar system is surrounded by the stars that we can see in the night sky. We live in a little neighborhood of stars, each of those stars, big balls of gas that, that are just like our sun, burning balls of gas. And those are much further away. So the nearest star to us the light takes four whole years to travel from that, sun, from that star to our eyes. And many of the ones that we see in the night sky take hundreds of years or more for their light to reach us. If we look at Orion, one of the things we know best, Orion's belt, some of those stars, the light set off 600 years ago on its journey to us. So it set off in the Middle Ages, and now it's just reaching our eyes just now. And so that's, again, quite, quite a big scale. That's, but that's just, that's our local clump of stars, the, our local bit of space. And now we step out again, and we find that our local group of stars is part of a much bigger object, a galaxy. In our case, the Milky Way. And this is an image of a galaxy. It's not our own Milky Way, because we will never be able to take a picture of our own Milky Way, because we will never be able to get outside it. But this is one that doesn't look too dissimilar to our own. And so a galaxy is this swirling, this one is a swirling disk of stars, about 100 billion stars, swirling around with these spiral arms and this denser core of stars at the middle. And this thing truly is immense. So if you were thinking about how long light would take to travel from one side to the other, it's about 200,000 years from one side to the other. Compare that to just our sun, eight minutes to get to our sun. Our sun's pretty far away. The moon is a second. The moon is already, you know, not that close. So 200,000 years and containing about 100 billion stars. And it's the gravity of all those stars, as well as a bunch of, of hot gas in there as well, that pulls it together and pulls it into this, this um, 
this, this object. And if this were our Milky Way, we would be living about halfway out from the middle, out to the edge, maybe there, in one of the spiral arms of our swirling disk of our galaxy. In there, a little, a little cluster of stars, and inside that, our sun, and going around that, our planets. So that's one of the biggest things in the universe. But if we zoom out again, we find that these galaxies live in kind of cosmic, cosmic towns and cities. They group together in groups of maybe 10 or ten, tens of galaxies or clusters of hundreds or thousands of galaxies, kind of pulled together by the force of gravity. And if we zoom out further still, we find a patch of the sky might look a little like this. So what we're seeing here is a little zoom in on a tiny bit of sky, just a tiny portion, uh, with this image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, one of our best telescopes, that zooms in and sees a, a sky dotted with lights. And every single one of those lights, almost, is a whole galaxy. So each one of these, you can see them more clearly. That one you can see, right? That's a spiral galaxy. This one is kind of a more weird shaped one. But there's more, more ones that you can't quite see clearly. Each one of those, a galaxy with 100 billion stars. And space is just full of these. The whole universe is scattered with galaxies, filling up space as far as we can see and we think beyond. So the part of it that we actually have access to is, contains about 100 billion galaxies. Again, each of them with about 100 billion stars. And then remember that within that, most of those stars probably have planets orbiting around them. So the chance of one of those planets having some kind of life to me and to many astronomers, seems pretty high. So this is the universe as we can see it. Full of all these, full of these, these, these stars within these galaxies. But it turns out that actually the part that we can see is only a small portion of the stuff that's actually out there. That there's actually much more stuff that fills space than we can actually see with our eyes or with our telescopes. And this was a big, one of the great pioneers in realizing this was this fantastic astronomer, Vera Rubin. Um, this is a picture of her back in the 60s or 70s, um, but she's still alive. She's now 88 um, and living in uh, Philadelphia. Um, she was this great astronomer who overcome quite a lot of challenges to get her degree and her do graduate work and, and, keep, and, and be a professional astronomer, including being the first woman to ever be allowed to operate a great new telescope in California to allow her to go and observe galaxies. Before that, only men were allowed to operate telescopes. It was off, off limits to, uh, to, to women. So what she wants to do was she went, she had a program to actually try and weigh galaxies, see how much they weigh. Now, if you want to go and weigh something here on Earth, get a weighing scale, put something on it, find out how much it weighs. The question is, how do you go and weigh something in space? Right? All you can do is look at it. How do you know how much it weighs? But it turns out that you can actually use Newton's law of gravity to help you out. And that just says that if you have something orbiting around a mass, that if you make that mass bigger, the thing will go around it faster. So if you can look at something spinning around and you can see how fast it spins, then you can tell how heavy is, heavy the thing is that's pulling it around. So Vera Rubin and her colleague, Kent Ford, went about measuring this property with whole galaxies. Because whole galaxies are just the same, actually. They're full of, they're full of these stars. They've got all this mass in them. And the more mass they've got in them, the faster they'll rotate. And so what they did was they went to measure very carefully a whole set of galaxies where they measured in fine detail how fast these galaxies were spinning around. Um, and what they found when they did that measurement is that the galaxies all seemed to be spinning around much too fast. Now, they knew how fast they thought they should spin because um, they could see all the light coming from these galaxies full of stars, and they kind of knew how much stars weigh. They knew how much they thought the galaxy should weigh, but it was just going too quickly. And the only way that made any sense was if actually each of these galaxies was not just the disk of stars that you could see, 
but actually something much, much bigger and much, much heavier. Something that was maybe five or ten times heavier, where the little disk of stars was just very much at the middle, surrounded by this huge halo of invisible stuff, invisible matter. And it was the only explanation that worked for all of these galaxies. And it actually picked up on something that an astronomer, Fritz Wicke, had noticed years before in one particular astronomical system. And he'd called this stuff dark matter. He said that this thought that there was stuff there that perhaps we couldn't see that was invisible. And so they picked this up, and, and Ruben and, and her colleague basically had, dis had, had discovered that our universe seems to be filled with dark matter. Now, we don't know what it is yet, but here's what we think it looks like. What I'm showing you here is a computer simulation of what we think actually underneath the universe looks like if we could only reveal all the invisible stuff. We think that the galaxies are just a kind of the bright lights of the cities that's showing up. And then what we think is kind of underneath is this skeleton or backbone of invisible matter, where this computer simulation shows what we think it looks like, where, the bright, where it's bright means we think there's lots of this invisible matter, this dark matter. And so you see this, these nodes of lots and lots of this stuff. And it's interconnected in this kind of, with these filaments connecting up nodes to the other ones. And then these big, big gaps in between. And so we think this simply threads throughout the whole of space, this network um, um, or web of invisible dark matter. And if we were to look at just the galaxies with our telescopes that can measure actual light, they would just be sitting on here. They would be like maybe a cluster of a clump of them would be sitting on there. There might be some lying along this line of extra where the dark matter is, where there's lots of it. Um, and that's where we'd find the, the, the visible galaxy sitting. But underneath, we think there's all this invisible stuff. Uh, but we don't know what it is. We think that it could be a new kind of particle. We know the stuff that we're made of. We're made of normal, normal atoms, things like carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen. Uh, we think this stuff is actually something completely new, a kind of particle that we've never seen before. And there's five times as much of it, on average, filling space as there is normal matter, the stuff that we're made of. Uh, it's a whole different... It's a huge amount of entirely new stuff. And one of my, one of our, my research groups... Uh, you know, quests is, and many other research groups' quests is to figure out what it is. So one of the things we're trying to do towards figuring it out is we want to go and actually try and measure it all. We want to see whether that computer simulation or what it looks like is right. Does it actually look like that? So then the question comes, how do you go and measure invisible stuff? It's pretty hard. As astronomers, we measure light. So we measure things that we can see. And so it's a challenge to try and figure out how to actually... I've told you that you can look at how fast things rotate, but we have to figure out different ways of, of looking for what the invisible universe looks like. And how we do it, one of the ways we do it, is we use this neat effect um, that comes from the bending of light. Let me explain this. Let's say I'm sitting here on Earth, and let's say next to me is not the sun, but a giant ball of invisible matter. Let's say you can't see this. It's totally invisible. If I had some light behind it, like a star or a galaxy behind it, and its light set off towards me, the gravitational, the pull of gravity of that big lump of dark matter would pull the light, distort it, bend its path, so that it would travel on this curve around towards me. And now, light doesn't normally do that. Normally, light just travels in straight lines. But if you have a lot of mass, it will pull the light round and, and disturb its path um, and change its direction. And we can actually use that to try and figure out um, where the invisible matter is in the universe. Let me show you another example. This is an old cartoon. Imagine up there, that little, that little cartoon is just a, is a set of galaxies in the night sky that we can measure with a, with a great telescope that can, that can pick out loads of galaxies, like we saw before from Hubble. Now, imagine putting in front of it, between those galaxies and you, put a giant blob of invisible stuff there. Something that, again, this is stuff that, that has the pulls like gra has, has gravity, 
pulls stuff like gravity, but just you can't see it. Put it in front. What it does is the light bends around it and has the effect of distorting the shapes of all those galaxies from nice little ovals into kind of smeared out shapes if the, if the dark matter blob was right in the middle. And so as it comes right, imagine the light sort of, the, 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 this big blob of dark matter is here, the light's kind of coming around it, and all those shapes get smeared out and slightly moved because of the, the gravity of the stuff in, in the way. And if we can look at that smearing out, this, this distortion, we can actually work out how much dark matter there was and where it was. Uh, of course, if you put much more in there, it, it would distort it more, put less, it would distort it less. And this is an example of the real sky where that's happening. This is a group or a cluster of individual galaxies. Each one of those spots of light is a galaxy with 100 billion stars or so. And these arcs here, these arcs of light, they are actually whole galaxies that have been smeared out into arcs because their light has come round some dark matter and it's stretched them out and it's distorted them to make this beautiful, these beautiful arcs around the edges. Because you should imagine there's a whole bunch of matter in the way there <laughs> that's kind of captured this light and, and, and stretched it around it. So that's just one little part of space that we can see with a very good telescope. Um, that's for me, that's not enough. For many of us, that's not enough. We want to go see all of it, right? We want to go and see all of these. We want to use all of the galaxies we can as backlights to try to trace out where this skeleton of the universe is, what it looks like. And so for that, we need big new telescopes. And so one of the ones that, we are, um, that we're getting excited about because it's, it's nearly ready is this great new telescope in Chile called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. It's pictured here just in uh, before construction. This is not a real image, um, it's, but it's being constructed right now. It's, it's sited here in Chile, just north of Santiago, um, on a mountaintop uh, that's, that's ideal for observing, observing galaxies. The air above is, is stable, and it's a great spot for, for looking for many, many galaxies. Um, and this will be a huge new telescope that will be able to basically scan the whole sky, or at least the whole sky observable from Chile, every few nights for 10 years. And um, this is a little model of what the telescope looks like. Uh, it's huge, right? So here, here's a person, uh, and here's the telescope. It's, uh, it's got a, a mirror in here, a huge mirror, um, with, a, with a, one of the largest cameras in the world, billions of pixels, much, much bigger than any of our, uh, both our own cameras and our phones, but also cameras that exist in most telescopes. Um, and by having this huge telescope with this fantastic new camera, we'll be able to scan the sky, scan the whole sky, and measure millions of galaxies, billions, but millions of them will be able to use to measure their little distortions and be able to reveal this, this invisible universe. So that will run for the whole of the 2020s, um, and that will illuminate you know, what until now has been this, this kind of this invisible part of our universe, um, and hopefully tell us a little bit more about, about what it is. So this will help us get towards um, what's kind of in our universe, right? We said we've got planets going around stars, stars in galaxies, galaxies in clumps, and then this web of dark matter that threads through the universe, surrounds galaxies, um, and, and creates this kind of this network. But um, my other kind of big question, one of my big questions is, well, f fine, <laughs> but how did it all get to be here? Right? This, is what, this is what I see in space, this is what I can make out of, of what's in space. But I want to know why we're here at all, and how did that start off? Because the universe that we see now, this beautiful space full of galaxies, wasn't always there and wasn't always like that. And one of our big clues to understanding kind of the history of the universe and, and where space has kind of come from came from um, Edwin Hubble back in the 1920s. So he made this really important discovery that, that our whole of the universe 
seems to be expanding, growing. And he made this discovery, and I'll go into this a bit more. So the observation he made was that if we sit here on the, in our Milky Way galaxy on, our, on Earth, and we look out at all these beautiful galaxies around us, they all seem to be moving away from us. And they're moving away from us in this pattern such that the ones that are further from us appear to be moving away from us faster. And this makes sense if the whole of space is growing. And an analogy I like is to imagine a bread dough. Okay, so imagine making a bread dough, putting it in a bowl, and letting it rise. As you let it rise, it grows. And it grows from everywhere. It doesn't grow from the middle. The yeast through it makes bubbles and, and air that make it grow throughout. And it gets bigger and bigger. And now imagine making, your, making out a raisin bread, <laughs> filling your dough with raisins. And imagine that those raisins are like your galaxies. And now imagine sitting on one of those raisins, try and make yourself very small, <laughs> and, and look out. And what do you see? Well, obviously you have to be able to see through dough, but let's go outside this for now. What do you see? You would see, if you were one of those raisins in the, in the dough, and the dough was rising, you would actually observe all the raisins around you to move away from you as the dough grows. None of them will move towards you because the whole thing is growing. And so you'll perceive from your little observation point on your raisin, everything moving away from you. And you'll also, if you take it a step further, the raisins nearby, you don't move very much. But the raisins on the other side of the dough actually move quite far as the whole thing grows. And that's in a fixed amount of time. So what that looks like is the ones that are further away from you actually move faster. That's your perception. But if you then went and jumped over to a different raisin and looked out again as the dough was rising, you'd see the same thing. You'd, uh, you'd feel like you're at the middle of, this, middle of this kind of growth, everything moving away from you, with the same pattern. And we think that space is doing something a lot like that. We just actually don't think there are any edges to that dough, that it's actually potentially infinitely big. Um, but it's still growing from everywhere, not growing from somewhere. Now, it's this observation of things, everything moving apart has a natural consequence, which is if everything moving is moving apart, then if you wind time backwards, everything is moving towards everything else. And at some point in the past, that all had to start off on top of everything else, if you just, if you just assume that nothing else crazy was going on. And that's what would be this, the car concept of the Big Bang, the beginning of some expansion. But we don't think that those same galaxies that we see now were actually there back then. <coughs> but before I go into that, I want to just note that this observation, which is key, this Hubble's law, is only was only possible because of uh, this great astronomer, um, Henrietta Swan Leavitt, um, who was working at the turn of the, century, turn of the last century at the Harvard Observatory um, with this fantastic group of women who were known as the Harvard Computers. Um, they were, there was this whole group of people engaged in this project to map all the visible stars we can see in the, in the night sky. Um, and the work was distributed such that all the men did operate the telescopes and all the women did the data analysis. Um, so, and unsurprising at the time, the women got paid like peanuts and, and they weren't allowed to do anything but you know, just analyze the data. But it turns out they got to find out some really cool stuff. Um, so this woman, Annie Jump Cannon, actually was the first person that made this. She figured out how stars should be classified into different types. And she, we still actually use today her, the types of stars that she came up with. Um, and then her colleague, Henrietta swan Leavitt figured out this incredibly important relationship, uh, this incredibly important pattern in these star variable stars they're called cepheid stars, and they pulsate. They're stars whose brightness changes with time. And she realized, she found this relationship that said that the brighter a star was, the longer it takes to pulsate. And this is incredibly important because if you can work out, if you can time how long a star takes to pulsate, you can figure out how bright it is. If you know how bright something is, you can figure out where it is, because you can figure out how faint you, you perceive it to be, 
and then you know how far away it is. So let's take an example of a 100-watt light bulb. If I know how bright a 100-watt light bulb is, which I do, then I can figure out how far away you're holding it by how bright I appear, it appears to me. If I put it at the back of the room, it will be, be pretty faint. If I put it here, it will be pretty bright. So one of the only ways to measure distances in space is to know how bright something is intrinsically. And once you know that, you can figure out where it is. So this discovery was key because she figured out that all you had to do, all you had to do, it's still quite a, quite a big job, <laughs> was figure out uh, how frequently these Cepheid stars pulsate. And then you could figure out how far away the galaxy was that they live in. And that's what Hubble then managed to do because Hubble took this pattern. He went to look at these galaxies beyond our own, saw these pulsating stars and figured out where they were and figured out his, his, his law. Um, but it wouldn't have been possible without, without um, Leavitt's relationship. As an aside, these two were also quite remarkable because they were both deaf. Um, and, but that didn't stop them. <laughs> they, uh, they did amazing stuff. OK, so we have this universe that's, um, that's continually growing. And, and we've come out kind of 14 billion. We, we know now that we, we're now living at about 14 billion years after whenever that the growth started. We think that um, our own star came into being about 5 billion years ago, um, and our galaxy a little earlier than that. Um, but I'm really interested in how the evolution started right back at the beginning. And so to do that, um, the, other, the other part of, of, of my group's research is um, measuring is looking back as far as it's possible to look. So I've told you a bit about distances and things being quite big in the universe. What I haven't really focused on is the fact that because light takes time to reach us, the further away you see something, the further back in time you get to see it. If something is, if the sun is eight minutes, if the sun, we see the sun as it was eight minutes ago. We see the stars in Orion's belt as they were 600 years ago. We see the neighboring galaxies to us as they were maybe a million years ago. That's how far away the neighboring galaxies are to us. And then I can see these more distant galaxies that I can see in this kind of image from Hubble billions of years ago. But it turns out that we don't think galaxies have been there all since the beginning. We think the first ones were only formed after about a billion years or less. And before that, we think there was just a soup of basically hydrogen atoms and some of this weird dark matter stuff and also light. And we think those basically three things were created at this earliest time when the universe is kind of right back at its beginning with everything on top of everything else. And what I do is I go and measure, I go and look for the light that was around since the Big Bang which means looking at stuff, I don't try and look at, I mean, I, the other part of my work is I want to look at galaxies. But with, with this other part, with this, with, this, um, with this telescope here, which is the Planck satellite, we look at stuff that's coming from way before galaxies were even formed, before even stars were formed. And we look at light that's been basically produced, was produced at the very beginning of time. It's been around since, since almost time zero. And it's called the cosmic microwave background. And it's light that's, that was produced right at the beginning. And actually, once you produce light, it's just there and it just can travel through space. So I can have light that's been around since the earliest moments. And it travels out in all directions. And some of it will travel for 14 billion years and hit me. It's hitting you right now. You're being hit by now by some rays of light that's, that have been going for billions of years. So, what I do is, or what, what, I, what my, me and my colleagues do, is um, we go look for it by sending up telescopes that can measure very faint, this very faint light that actually now has been traveling for so long that it's extremely cold. It's like minus 270 degrees below zero. And its wavelength is much longer than we would see with our eyes or with regular telescopes that can see kind of starlight. It measures microwave light, which is its wavelength is maybe about a millimeter or a centimeter long, if you think of its wave. Um, and this is the Planck satellite that, um, that was launched back in 2009, 
on this uh, rocket from French Guiana. And it was sent off uh, a million miles from here to this really uh, stable, quiet point where you've got out beyond the Earth's atmosphere and you can just sit and stare, uh, stare at the sky. And you stare at it and you see through, you basically look through all the galaxies, you look past all that, and you look for light that's been actually traveling for the longest time possible. And we get this somewhat strange image of um, just a bit of our universe when it was only 400,000 years old. And what is this? It's a weird, we, you may have seen it before, but it's always a bit of a strange picture because it doesn't look like space, right? It doesn't look like galaxies. It doesn't look like stars. It's just these blobby, different colours. What this is, is a little picture of part of space where the colours, the colours measure the temperature of this light, but more importantly, what they're measuring is the kind of density of space when the universe was only 400,000 years old. Now, on average, the density of space actually is completely uniform back then, almost. Um, and what we're seeing when we see this little, where it's hot or, sorry, where it's blue or red, we're seeing slight deviations from the uniform density, ever so slightly more dense or less dense than the average. But actually, it's by only about one part in a million. So we think that going back to when the universe was only this old, that actually space was remarkably boring, right? Just actually, we think it was this basically sea of more or less three types of things, hydrogen atoms, dark matter particles, whatever they may be, and rays of light. And it was almost completely uniform as well, like no features, just this, this kind of you know, uniform density everywhere of these things. And we think that's what space was full of back there. But the fact that you can see these blobs tells you, and the blobs are, again, they're, they're, they're variations about the mean density of a part in a million. And this is everything, because these are the very seeds of everything that will form later on. Because if you have, if we had a completely uniform soup of this stuff, and we had no features at all, if there's no blobs in this picture, then we would have a completely featureless universe forevermore. We would not have arrived in this universe. We, we would have no stars, no planets, no galaxies, nothing. We would just have a very boring sea of hydrogen. <laughs> but we are here, and we're here because of these little features. And what happened is that these little, where you had some region that was this, a little blob that was slightly more dense than other regions, Gravity would pull more stuff towards it gradually, and stuff would move towards this slightly more dense region, and it would also move towards another dense region over there somewhere. And it would pull and pull this hydrogen, this dark matter, this, these rays of light together. And it would keep doing that for a few million years until suddenly the density of this stuff is high enough that you can collapse and form a star and the first stars are born. And they've come about from these initial, these initial blobs, these initial tiny little features, these small density variations. Um, and then you just evolve it forward, and you get that, which is the night sky full of galaxies. And it all, the, it kind of makes sense to us now. We can track it through, you know, we can run our computer codes, we can put this stuff in. We can't make all these galaxies perfectly look like they look. Um, but it, but it makes sense to us. It works out. The kind of features that we see in space totally match this idea that we're seeing the very beginnings of them back in this, in this, in this microwave background light. And that's, that's great. That's been a kind of a big achievement in understanding the evolution of, of the universe. But we now want to figure out why those features are there in the first place. And what happens at the beginning? You know, I'm saying we're seeing this bit of the universe when it was 400,000 years old. Well, not good enough, right? I want to know <laughs> what happens when it was zero, and I want to know why, you know, why it began um, and what it was doing. So to try and understand more about this, again, we, we need new telescopes. Um, and the telescope that I am most involved with and my team 
um, is this one, which is also in Chile, a bit further north than the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. And it's in the Atacama Desert at this uh, fearfully high altitude of 5,200 metres, which is one of the highest telescopes on Earth. Um, it sits in this, it's, it's sitting right, it's right in there. Um, and it's this great location. It's one of the two best places on Earth to look for this faint light from the Big Bang from. The two best places are northern Chile in this desert and the South Pole. And so we have, there are teams working in both locations and our team work, work in Chile. And so hidden in, down in there is our telescope called the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. Um, and it's pictured here, uh, surrounded by a big screen to try and shield it from anyth anything that can come up from the Earth, light from the Earth. And it's this big six meter aluminium dish telescope that swings around and observes the sky. And what we're doing is we're trying to take a better picture of that faint uh, ancient light than we could do with Planck. Because we built a telescope that can look with better sensitivity, uh, with higher definition than the previous satellite could do. Um, now I love this, I, I love this project too because it's, we're a small team of about 70 people. And this telescope is, we operate it. We don't have um, people who operate the telescope for us. Uh, you know, we take it in turns to remotely observe with a telescope, you know, 24 hours a day. If the telescope breaks in the night, you know, Skype wakes you up and says, go fix it. Um, and, uh, and so it's a great example of also how we work as a team of scientists. You can't, no one can do any of this by ourselves. Certainly the case for the tel that big telescope, the optical one, LSST, that I showed you before. And it's certainly the case for this. You can't do science like this on your own. You have to do it with a team. And that's one of the things I love about this, doing this, is that you all have your piece to play. And together you do so much more than you could ever do by yourself. And you have some people who are better at building experiments, some people who are better at thinking about the theory, some people who are better at analysing the data. Uh, you know, someone who can just make the telescope work when it's just not working. Um, and you all have different skills and different, different, um, uh, different things we're good at. And together that makes it fun and also means there's a place for, there's a place for everyone. Um, and that's, that's, to me, that's really exciting. What we're doing with this, is we're looking for this very faint signal that should be embedded, could be embedded in this light that comes from the earliest times. And what we're looking for is the signature of a very energetic event in the first fraction of a second in the universe that could have driven the initial growth of space. And if some theories are right, what that would have done is it would have actually rippled space-time itself at the very earliest moments, the energetic expansion would have sent out actually ripples that, streets, that stretch and squeeze space itself um, as, uh, as this event happened. Now, these things which are called gravitational waves, we now know they do exist because they've been beautifully observed by the LIGO experiment last year, coming from colliding black holes. These same ripples in space-time coming from very, gravi very intense gravitational uh, effects distorting space-time. We know they exist, but we want to see if they actually were produced during the Big Bang at the earliest parts of its, its um, expansion. And so we're looking for signatures of those hidden or buried in um, this, this, um, this microwave light. So that's what we're doing with this telescope. To, to do that even better, we're actually going to be building some new telescopes on the same site, uh, bigger and better. <laughs> um, uh, and we're starting this program called the Simons Observatory um, that will go on the sky in 2020. Um, and that's one of the things that, that, that me and my team are, are now busy working on. So I hope that we will see some signatures of, of the very first moments in time and see how these initial ripples, these initial features were put in uh, that, that then made us much later on. Now, <coughs> I have all these questions. And I'll probably get to answer some of them while I'm a scientist, but I won't be able to answer all of them. Most of them I won't be able to answer. And I'm not too disheartened by that, because that's part of being a scientist, right? You pick up where others have left off. Generations have done all the work before us. We do our bit. 
and then we hand it on and we hand it on to our, our students and their students and they keep going. Um, and astronomy is actually strewn with examples of people who had a vision of what they wanted to go measure, but they never saw it, but it was okay because someone else did. And that's what, what, one of the things that also makes doing, doing science, and doing research so pleasing is that you want to get the new result yourself, but you're also pretty pleased if you know that someone's going to get it 20 years from now, as long as it's going to happen. Um, but to do this, if we're going to actually answer the questions that I care about, and I also care about other science questions too, if we want you know, our, our best minds trying to do things like figure out how to design new energy sources, figure out medical, uh, medical solutions to things, we want our best young people working on it. And that means getting all our best young people. It doesn't just mean uh, getting white males, for example. <laughs> we, need, we need everyone. White males are fine too. <laughs> um, um, we want everyone. And so, so what, what, what am I doing? Um, one of the things I'm doing is, and this is part of my project to do this award, is I've been writing a book for this past year that's a popular science book about the universe, about astronomy and our understanding of, of, of what's in the universe. And related to that, it'll come out in, in, in the next year, um, I'll be bringing schoolgirls in to Oxford who are GCSE level students to, to do workshops and have lectures um, on uh, astrophysics, physics, and, and try and motivate more of them to, to keep going with it, to, to realize how exciting the stuff that we do is and to, and to, to pursue it further. Um, I'll also be making some movies about some of the great women scientists that I've been learning about that I knew something about, but I've learned more about by, by doing my own research. Um, because you need examples. It's, it's this whole thing of, of role models. You want to be able to see that you're not strange or unusual or you don't fit in, that people like you do it too. Um, and so I want to have examples um, of that. And I'll also be giving, some, giving a bunch of lectures um, uh, to the general public about, about space. Because also the general public, I think, also need to... It's not just about persuading 15-year-old girls to study physics. It's about persuading the general public, parents, teachers, that we can all be good at it. That it's not just you know, some, some group of people who should be doing physics, that should be doing science. That it really is all of us. Um, and there's no reason for that not to happen. Um, and so I'm just going to leave you with some thoughts of what you, know, you could do or what we might want to try and get teachers to do too. One thing that's been extremely striking to me, I've, I've got a three-year-old daughter, and it drives me completely bananas that I go into shops and it's split into girls' and boys' toys, and the boys' toys have got tools, they've got solar systems, they've got planets, and the girls have got tea sets and dolls. And, you know, I'm at least able to go and shop in both sections. My daughter loves tea sets and dolls as well, but she also loves rockets and trains and planets. And breaking down the idea from the very earliest ages that there's a particular thing that you should be doing um, is, to me, really important. So if you're a parent, you know, buy your daughter, build your daughter a toy rocket with her and shop in both sections and try and, you know, encourage companies to stop, stop doing this. Um, I think we also need a lot more careers advice in school about the careers you can do if you pursue science. Because it's not, it was never obvious to me that, that there are so many things that you can do if you do a science degree, in particular if you, do, if you study physics. Um, but actually, if you did a physics degree, you would never be out of a job. Um, and I don't think everyone knows that. And I think perhaps particularly girls maybe want the security of knowing what careers there are at the end of, of studying something. And I think we need to have more uh, images of diverse scientists, both in textbooks, up in schools, up in universities, um, and try and have more, change the profiles of typical scientists and physicists in the media, um, in, in TV and film. It's very rare that you'll have a woman physicist appearing in a TV show, right? Um, but that can change. I think, too, if you're, if you're a woman scientist, you have a, you know, if, if you can bear it, be visible, right? Show people yourself. Talk about your work. Um, and if you're a male scientist, strive for, strive for that change, too. Um, because we, we exist. There's this phenomenal group of both male and female scientists 
doing this kind of doing new research, pushing the boundaries of, of physics and other science. Um, and it's definitely not limited to one sort of person. I'll stop there. I think you can see why we were so excited to give Joe this award. It was a fantastic lecture, very inspirational, and I hope young people and older people will take on board her message because I think it was beautifully delivered. I shall think differently about baking bread and raisins <laughs> from now on. Uh, if there's any sensible comments and questions, I'm sure Joe will be happy to answer. If you could raise your hand and then a microphone or come to you, hopefully. <laughs> Just here. <coughs> Hi. Uh, <laughs> um, you're absolutely right about uh, young girls coming through school. My daughter, um, only at, she was the first generation four years ago. Yeah. Um, it was no science degrees before that. And then her class of uh, 12, eight of them got AAs, triple A's in their sciences. Yeah. She went on to Bristol, and um, the problem is there's a, a massive great um, block. She got a first in her, po in her um, the BA part, and she was promised to get um, work experience, you know, the gap year, mm. um, in, in her chosen subjects. Yeah. The four girls in the course never got a gap year placement. All the boys? got their placements. They were the first off the track. They had the yeah. placements within two weeks and the girls were left there and the tutor said, well, it's okay. So we tried to help. The tutor refused our, um, we got into Glaxo. Yeah. But they said, no, it's not part of the course. So she's not allowed to do that. So they were even stopping her from using her initiative to get out there. Now <laughs> she's disillusioned. She's taking her MA. Yeah. But she wants to give up all that science. That's such a sh And she's got A stars, and she's got a star in this, and she's got a chosen subject, but she now wants to give it up because she can't see a future. No one wants to know a, a woman. That's really, I'm so, I'm so sad to hear that. And it, I mean, to me, it sounds like the, the tutor should be responsible for making sure that happens. I mean, I would say for, for me as well, for me, one of the things that's made my you know, career, you know, straightforward and, and work is great mentors and, and mostly male mentors you know both um, undergraduate advisors PhD advisors postdoc advisors they've been the ones who've promoted me and pushed me and supported me and y you you need that and so we have to make sure that people have the support network and that people are trained to make sure that doesn't happen because that shouldn't happen <laughs> so I hope I think all, awful girls yeah no, we, none we of have them to, were given that chance we have to change it What did you say? Yeah, good. <laughs> I have lots of thoughts. Okay, uh, I suspect that dark matter is a new kind of particle that we haven't found yet. But the favourite sort, there was a, for a long time, there's been a favourite theory that every particle in our universe has got this p partner called a supersymmetric partner, and that one of those could be the dark matter. But we were hoping to create that at the Large Hadron Collider in, in Switzerland, and we haven't seen it yet. And so even though it's possible that, that, is, that it's that, you know, people are now getting a little more nervous. We had a great workshop last week where we, where we had a big workshop on, you know, what could it be if it's not what we kind of thought it was? And the answer is there are lots of possibilities. Um, we have to try and, um, try and look for signatures, not just in what I'm doing, but look for actual... Uh, look for s faint hints of actual particles colliding in our galaxy with normal ones. Um, neutrinos are actually a, a subclass of the dark matter. They make up about half a percent of all the dark matter, and these are very, very light particles um, that zoom along almost at the speed of light. And those we know are there, and actually one of the big things that, that my team are trying to do are actually use our data from cosmology to work out how much they weigh. And we actually hope to do that in the next 10 years or so. 
I didn't even touch on dark energy, which if I, I kind of had two things that I told you about. <laughs> My third one would have been dark energy. So I told you that space is growing. Actually, it seems to be growing faster and faster. And that's really weird because we always thought it should be slowing down. And the only thing that can kind of make space grow faster and faster is if we have this thing that we're calling dark energy, which could just be the energy of empty space, that as space grows, you get more and more of it. And, and you can sort of shuffle around your energy budget in the universe, and you can put more of it into the, the energy of empty space. And as that gets, as you grow and grow, more of it goes into the kind of empty space energy, and it makes the universe expand faster and faster. Um, but we don't know if it's right, and we don't have a good theory that says that that's why that's right. So it's one of the big open questions that we're trying to sort out as well. <laughs> um, so yeah, watch this space. It's a good question. We will never be able to see back to zero. So there's this weird thing. So the reason I, have to, I could only see back to 400,000 years is that before that, the universe, this, this soup of hydrogen and dark matter and photons was so hot that all the atoms were split up into their, they've got a proton and an electron and an atom, and they were split up. And it made it into this kind of, not a soup, but like a plasma. And light can't travel in straight lines through that kind of thing. If you break up atoms into electrons and, hydrogen, and, and, and protons, light is sort of traveling straight through to you, keeps bouncing off electrons. And it makes it into a bit of, it makes it like a cloud. It makes the early bit of the universe opaque. We will never be able to see light from there because it's not traveling in straight lines to us. So we have this hard deadline that we can only see back to 400,000 years. But what we do then is we put in the physics that we think happened at time zero. We use our computers to kind of evolve the universe to 400,000 years and we compare them. So even though we can't see back, we can use what we do see to figure out whether we understood correctly what was going on early on. So it's a, it's a, it's a fix. <laughs> I had a question there. Mm, uh, so the question is, since uh, dark matter itself seems to not, uh, seems to allow light to pass through it, it wouldn't be transparent, but it would still be there, and therefore light's not hitting through it? Well, could you explain that? Oh, yeah, so I didn't explain this very well. So, so actually, we think that if dark matter is small, is, is just a new kind of particle, Light can actually just pass, you know, straight past it. Um, it doesn't interact with it. And so it's probably that some of the, the favourite ideas are that it's a particle that's heavier than, like, the normal protons that fill up our normal atoms, but maybe not, like, you know, it's maybe a, a number of times heavier, but not, it's not made up probably of, well, <laughs> there are some recent theories that say maybe it's, like, giant black holes, actually, <laughs> in which case they would stop the light. <laughs> But generally, we think they're just big, you know, slightly bigger than ours. And so most of the light just passes straight through. Yeah. Um, so all this light charging, and then you've got this great big, and the light gets bent. Yeah. Does that slow it down? Mm. No. It just, uh, if, it was, if, it was, if it's just travelling through space, it doesn't get slowed down. But if it were travelling through something, it would get slowed down. So light would travel slower through, like, a liquid or if it tried to travel through something else. But if it's just travelling through space, it keeps going at, the, at normal speed. Yeah. Maybe one last question? <laughs> Two last questions, sorry. So you were talking about the soup at the beginning. Yeah. So why are there, why are there different densities? Good question. So um, this is... There's, there's one explanation that's kind of the favourite explanation that I've, sudden, I've started feeling a bit more sceptical about, but let me tell you anyway, which is that these little overdensities actually come about from little uh, quantum fluctuations. So normally if you have like a non-expanding universe and you just had a box of the soup, <laughs> you could actually, quantum mechanics tells me that I should continuously kind of create particles and they should vanish away again, create, vanish, create, vanish, all the time. But if you have this kind of creation and vanishing going on, and you are then stretching space actually faster than the speed of light, which is a possibility, quite a feasible possibility of what happened very early on. You can actually stretch space that fast. If you did that and you had these quantum fluctuations, they then actually get frozen in because they get so far apart from each other that they don't know that the other bit exists. And, <laughs> and it gets stuck. And, um, and 
that then can be the initial bit of overdensities. And even though it sounds a bit far-fetched, the pattern that you'd predict from this exactly matches what we see. So even though there are some people, theorists, who are kind of skeptical about this, this idea, it is like a perfect match to all our data. So right now, it's the kind of probably the, one of the favorite scenarios. So um, I've just jumped into my A-levels this year, and cool. I've taken maths, physics, and chemistry. Um, I was just wondering if you had any advice on, um, like, they're all really male-dominated. And I was just wondering if you had, like, any advice for the next two years. <laughs> uh, be confident. If you, I remember I started, I went off, I didn't even know I wanted to do physics, actually, for sure. I started, I did physics, maths, and chemistry at A-level. Um, and I realized that I kind of, preferred physics because I like to see how the maths could describe the real world. I love the maths, but I wanted to see how it, how it applied. And then I went to Cambridge for my undergraduate degree, and there I kept studying physics and chemistry and other things. And I was really worried that I wouldn't be able to cope with the physics because it was always thought to be like the hardest one. And I started in a group of other undergraduate students with a couple of pretty arrogant men. Um, <laughs> And I thought, oh, I'm not good enough at this. I'm not going to be able to be good enough at physics. Um, and, and I thought, oh, I'm going to be really bad in my exams. I'm not going to be good enough. And, um, and it turns out, you know, I was. <laughs> was good enough, right? I did better than them in the exams. Some of them went off to do stuff that was not physics. Um, and so, so much of it is just being sure of yourself, saying, I can do this, right? There are plenty, there are so many, even though there aren't enough of us, there are so many women who do do physics, who do do chemistry, who do do maths. Um, and so you can do it. You just have to, I think, have a little more, try and have a little more confidence. I'm not saying you don't have confidence, but be confident that there's no reason you shouldn't be there and doing it. And just being surrounded in a group of, of male students doesn't mean anything about your abilities. And finally, I'd like to thank you for the line, if you are a woman scientist, be visible. I will use this as a motto when I will be lecturing in Poland. Uh, I have a question. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, there was an article in New Scientist saying that the universe could be seen as a sh in the shape of a pancake. Uh, I wonder what is your gut feelings about this theory. <laughs> Thank you. Gosh, I don't know. Um, I, think, um, I, think a pa I think an actual pancake shape would be unlikely because we think there's no... I, I, I'm, not sure about the, I'm not sure about the article or the model, so I can't, I can't comment specifically. But we have no reason to, I think, believe that there's any difference in the three dimensions spatially of what's going on in the three dimensions. Um, now, again, I don't, know, I don't know what this refers to, but there are some nice models that think about our universe kind of lying on something, not exactly like a pancake, but like a sheet that then maybe collided with another one. But this is actually in a higher dimension where like the three, it's kind of like you're tr trying to imagine the three dimensions being collapsed onto a two-dimensional pancake and it colliding with a different one to start the Big Bang. But that requires a whole new dimension. But I actually don't know, I, don't, I didn't see this article, so that, that may be, they may be talking about a completely different kind of pancake universe. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can't comment. I think we should leave it with the pancake universe. <laughs> and to thank Jo again for this tremendous lecture and then present her with her award. So, thank you. Beautiful. Rosalind, thank, thank you, you very much. much. <laughs>